welcome back to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor. We are back at it again with another unscripted review today, and today we are going over James Cameron's 1997 film Titanic. This movie has a lot of ups and downs, big moments, dull moments, exciting moments, sad moments. There's a lot of things that happen in this movie, and I know that it is kind of a mixed bag when it comes to the ship community on how we feel about this movie, because I know I had a lot of mixed emotions going into it. To really give you kind of a background on my feelings and why it does feel so mixed for me, I watched this movie when I was a lot younger, and I loved it. I kind of grew up watching it, you know, when you had the two VHS tapes, so you take the one VHS tape, watch it, and then you take the other VHS tape and watch it to see the sinking. So I remember a lot of this movie and really having a fondness for it. But as I've gotten older, I've gotten more into history, more into ships, more into really looking at the true side of all sinkings, not just Titanics. There are small things that bother me in this movie that didn't used to bother me so much. And maybe it's just me being nitpicky or really wanting this to feel as historically accurate as possible, and so I'm going into it with the wrong expectations, but I'm not sure. All I know is that there are a lot of good things about this movie, and there's a lot of bad things about this movie as well. And I don't know if it's equal or not. We'll see at the end. We're gonna start with the things that I really enjoyed with it. I took notes while watching this movie, because although I've seen it a hundred thousand times and I know it like the back of my hand, I wanted to take notes on small things that really mattered to me. So I took notes on the pros, the cons, and historical inaccuracies, and we'll go through it in that order. So we're gonna start with the pros. As for the pros, the number one thing in this movie that I love is the score. The score is very emotionally impactful. Sure, it's not like a John Williams score that's immediately recognizable, like the Superman theme or the Star Wars theme, but it's still highly recognizable. If you hum it to somebody, they know it. Also, the cinematography. Any James Cameron film is going to be beautifully shot, especially if it has to do with water. He's very passionate about showing the accuracy of the ocean and showing the beauty of the ocean. So the cinematography in this movie was great to me, and even though it is an older film, the CGI still holds up really well to me. I also like the imagery we use with seeing Titanic's wreck. He uses a mix of real footage of the wreck and recreations. Of course, I myself, because I'm kind of a history nerd, I get more excited when I see the real shots of Titanic, but I still really enjoyed the cinematic pieces that kind of tied it all together, made the movie feel a little bit more genuine that way too. I honestly felt, for the most part, I will say there are small exceptions, we'll get to that later, for the most part, a lot of the actual people that were in this movie, like Molly Brown, like Thomas Andrews, really felt genuine to me. Those two especially were my standout characters. I've always thought that they were kind of sim and roll people, if that makes sense to you. They're just so sweet, generous, kind. And I've read a ton of documents that state they really were that way, that genuine niceness. And so I really enjoyed Victor Garber's portrayal of Thomas Andrews and Kathy Bates' portrayal of Molly Brown. Both of them were phenomenal in that, great casting choice, and not only that, I think that the way James Cameron captured their likeness was incredibly real to who those people really were. The same thing goes for 5th Officer Lowe. I think they really showed how much he did care going back and looking for survivors and the guilt he must have felt by not going back sooner. You know, I'm going to say that a lot of things in this movie look great, like Titanic looked great, the ROVs looked great, the Cafe Parisian, like all of the things that we see in the Titanic to me look accurate, look beautiful. It's one of the most gorgeous shots we'll ever get of Titanic besides the VR game and even like the VR game that is out to me is just more reliving the sinking rather than being on the ship. So that is one thing I really appreciated about James Cameron's movie that instead of just focusing on the gloom and doom kind of like A Night to Remember did it more focused on the sinking really. This movie focused on all of it. We built relationships with the people who were on the ship as well as our fictional characters and we really got to see what life was like in the Edwardian period on the Titanic and saw how society was, how the third class interacted and how the first class interacted and how they kind of butted heads, how it really did not seem like, you know, they were ever gonna get along because the third class to me felt very genuine, homegrown, 
and I just feel like the first class just kind of felt really stuck up, and I could see why. I mean, maybe it's some of it is tropes. I know that not all of these people can be put in these generalized stereotypes, but for me, it really did show the class division very well. There's also a lot of small mentions in here that are really nice details that James Cameron paid attention to and I appreciated. Rose, when she first sees the Titanic, mentions that it doesn't look any larger than Mauritania. And I loved the fact that we got to hear the name of a Cunarder of another steamship in this film, other than, you know, like the Californian or the Carpathia. We got to hear about passengers who had been on other ships and they're comparing them, which you totally would, you know? So it's like, it's just like people nowadays go, oh yeah, I've stayed in the Ritz-Carlton and I've stayed in whatever hotel and this one's better and this one's kind of okay over here. And they compare stuff. It's kind of like they were almost giving a tiny mini review just in one statement. And so... I really liked just hearing that mention of a Cunarder. That was really good for me. I was like, oh, that's a really nice touch. A really nice small detail is when they're loading the Titanic, they pan out and they do a big shot. You can see the pneumatic and the traffic, the two tender boats right next to the ship. I'm like, that's a really nice detail and I really appreciate that. And when we're in Cherbourg, we see the nomadic and the traffic. And I love seeing our tender boats. I love seeing those tiny little boats. They're good detail. You know they were really there. So it's like James Cameron really did a good job paying attention to those small details and giving us that kind of genuine feel. Another thing that was really tiny, but that felt really true for me, was also that when they hit reverse on the engines, they put a full astern, the center propeller stopped spinning. And that was something that I was like, that is a really nice detail to add in there because that's exactly how the ship worked. So it was cool to see that. Of course, the propeller blades were not accurate. As we know from a 2007 article that Titanic had three propellers with only three blades on each. I know it's a small detail, but it always bugs me. The propeller blades are a rock I will die on. The propeller blades need to be accurate for me. It always, I don't know why it bothers me so much. It always does, but Titanic's propeller blades are something I'm very stingy about. However, besides my rant about propeller blades, the emotion in this film is like almost catastrophic. I can't, I almost can't watch this film anymore. I was putting the disc into the DVD player and I was crying then because I knew it was going to happen in this film. Granted, I'm really sappy, but the love story really, although can be distracting at times, is a really nice vehicle for the viewer to move through the Titanic and to experience it through something that is relatable. Being in love is something that's very relatable. Losing, losing someone you love is something that is relatable. Having both of those things happen on one ship that was called the Ship of Dreams is just tragic. I also liked that there's another small detail that Jack mentioned. He mentioned working on tramp steamers and I'm like, hell yes, work on tramp steamers. We love hearing about them, especially with us just talking about Mont Blanc last month. It was a great addition for me to just hear about tramp steamers. Another really small detail that I was like, if you weren't a ship nerd, you wouldn't catch this, but if you are a ship nerd, you appreciate it deeply. Rose was going to jump off the stern and, you know, do the thing that is unaliving themselves. And Jack stops her and says, you see that water down there? That water is cold and it's so cold it feels like a thousand knives. I'm like, that is what Charles Lightoller described the water feeling like when he ended up in it. So it's a really nice detail for them to just have it stated by another character and still keep that piece of information in there. I also like that when we see the wreck in the beginning, we see same shots of those places on the wreck later in the form before the ship actually sinks. So you get to see it in both forms, after the tragedy and before. So I think it was a nice touch. And of course, James Cameron is very attentive with details, especially you can see it in this film. So it was just all the nice small details that I really enjoyed in this. Okay, we're going to move on to the cons. I've already kind of raved about this movie, but now you're gonna kind of feel like I am going to totally rant on this movie. I will give you a score at the end about how I feel about it, but this is gonna be where we get into my cons. One of my cons is also a pro. The love story takes a huge precedence in this movie. It can be a good thing because it's a good vehicle, like I said, for the viewer to move through Titanic, but it can also really detract from the actual story of Titanic and from the story of the real life people who were there. However, I personally don't believe that this movie was made for history buffs and ship nerds. I think that A Night to Remember was, 
built for people who really wanted to see a historically accurate recollection of the sinking. I believe that this one is somewhere in the middle. There are historically accurate facts in here, especially for the time of 1997. We do have to keep that in mind. That information has changed since then. We have discovered new things. So some of the things that I'm going to say are historically inaccurate later. You know, James Cameron had no way of knowing that it was going to be historically inaccurate 25 years later. Anyway, this love story can really kind of detract because it takes away from the whole depth of the tragedy for me, even though it does add to it as well. So I think there's an argument for both sides of saying, I don't like this movie because of the love story or saying, I do like this movie because of the love story. You know, it attracts a wider audience by adding the love story into it. So I see why it was. I also had a problem with the portrayal of Lytoller and Murdoch. Personally for me, now, you know, I can't say whether or not these portrayals are accurate. I was not there. I did not personally know Murdoch or Lytoller, of course, that was 110 years ago. But to me, they just seemed overly violent, weak-minded at points, and just indecisive. And it just didn't seem right to me. I just didn't like it, especially after you see the way Lytoller is portrayed in A Night to Remember. That really feels heroic, almost overly so. But then in Titanic, he doesn't feel like a hero at all, when really he was. He did do some heroic stuff, and that should be highlighted. So I have a hard struggle with this, of knowing where the balance is. And I think that this film might have taken it too far in one direction. We do have to talk about the fact that makeup and hair for this movie did lean more toward the 90s than it did the Edwardian period at times. Most women would not be seen with their hair down with loose curls, like Rose was, unless, you know, they were going to bed. Um, but of course... You know, Kate Winslet looked good with the curls down, so they let her do that. And of course, Jack's hairstyle was more 90s than anything. But that was the style at the time, so I can understand why they went with that. But when they did the updos and stuff, it really did feel accurate. And we can't really say anything about makeup because stage makeup and, you know, movie makeup is always going to be made to try to make it look natural. But you can tell it's not natural, especially, you know, if you're familiar with the way foundation sits on the skin and stuff like that. It's going to be a little bit more noticeable. So that's just a minor nitpick and it really didn't bother me too much. I just had to say it just in case, you know, there's anyone out there who it really bothers. Also, the portrayal of Captain Smith to me was big question mark, and the portrayal of Ismay. Ismay, it's been debated in history books and will be debated to the rest of time, whether or not he was a coward and had the right to get on a lifeboat, or if he wasn't a coward and shouldn't have gotten on a lifeboat. You know, there's just going to be that debate everywhere. People are going to say it's right, people are going to say it's wrong. For me, it just kind of felt a little bit icky, but it did feel accurate to the information at the time, so I couldn't argue. Captain Smith, however, for me, felt a little wishy-washy. At times, he seemed kind of frazzled, and then at other times, he seemed like, okay, I'm gonna be honorable and go down with my ship. I liked that moment, but when he seemed frazzled, there's been accounts where it said he wasn't frazzled. So, of course, we have to take into account that, yes, some eyewitnesses state that he seemed almost paralyzed with fear, and others state that he was brave and fearless and was taking charge the entire time. So, who really knows? But it just kind of bothered me a little bit. Another thing that bothered me was that there was no mention of SS Californian whatsoever, and I think that was a real missed opportunity in this film because the SS Californian is one of the biggest controversies in the sinking. People are going to be talking about the SS Californian and criticizing it until the day the Earth explodes, I think, because it's just something that is so crazy to think about. A ship was only about 10 miles away and didn't stop to help people because they didn't know what was going on. So I think it was a missed opportunity to not at least mention the Californian. You know, the Carpathia was mentioned, of course, but they didn't mention the Californian, the Mount Temple, none of those ships that also responded to this distress call or had given ice warnings. And my final con is also playing Nearer My God to Thee. Yes, I know that it has been fantasy or legend since the Titanic sank, that Nearer My God to Thee was the last song that the band played. I believed it for a long time too, but it's probably not true. Based upon most research, now, you know, there's also a chance that it could have been true, so I'm not saying it's ultimately like 100% not true, but in my mind, it's like 90% that it probably didn't happen because that would have incited 
even more panic than what was already happening because that is a song that people are like, oh shit, I'm gonna die. So I don't think people would want to hear that when that ship is almost completely out of the water with the stern. So I don't think the band would have played that at that point. I honestly don't. But it was added into this film and it was a really nice touch because it was a good way to show some sadder scenes with, you know, people who had stayed on the ship and were now perishing there with Captain Smith, with Thomas Andrews. It was a nice way to close that door, but it did feel a little wishy-washy for me. We're going to get into some historical inaccuracies and let's keep in mind here that this was 1997, it was only 12 years after Titanic was actually found. So in that time since we have found the ship, well we, Robert Ballard, since the ship has been discovered, more things are unearthed all the time. So information is constantly evolving and it's the most studied shipwreck by far because the story has just fascinated people for over a century. So we do have to keep that in mind. With that out of the way, some of the historical inaccuracies right off the top is, you know, Rose and her family with Ruth and Cal, they aren't actual passengers, and Jack Dawson wasn't a real passenger either. There was a passenger named Jack Dawson, but this Jack Dawson in the movie was not based upon that person, as far as I know. The Heart of the Ocean necklace is not a real necklace that was actually on the Titanic, but because it was in this movie, it will forever be linked to that. And I have met countless people on the street that are not ship nerds that completely believe that the Heart of the Ocean is a real necklace that was on that ship. And then having to break it to them that that's not real, it's actually just fiction. They look devastated. <laughs> And I'm not gonna lie, when I was a kid, I totally thought there was a real necklace on the ship too. I mean, who wouldn't? Especially if the rest of the movie feels so genuine, why wouldn't you feel that this necklace was in it? This next thing I get into might tick some people off, but I have to address it. There is a scene in this movie where Murdoch salutes a fellow officer and then shoots himself. I don't know how to feel about this because there are rumors that he did it, so I cannot just outwardly, blatantly deny that it ever happened. But I just honestly don't think it did. And I just don't think that he would have done that. I do believe he died on the sinking because, you know, they never recovered his body. He was listed as one of the dead. But I don't believe that he shot himself. What I believe happened is that he went into the water, just like a lot of people did, and died from cold shock. So for me, that small detail in the movie really, really bothered me and really stuck with me and kind of made me angry. Almost took me out of the movie for a moment because I'm like, that just doesn't seem right and it just seems so abrupt. Um, I know that that rumor is, exists though, so it might be true and I can't just totally discount it, but it really did bother me because I personally don't feel it is true. There is a lake that Jack Dawson mentions to Rose when he's talking about ice fishing when they first meet. He's talking about how cold the water is. It says Lake Wasoda, and I just have to let you guys know that that lake wasn't named until like 1920. So the fact that he mentioned it in 1912 is just a little oops, but you know, you win some, you lose some. And also another inaccuracy is the number of people that were pulled from the water. Rose said six, including herself. And of course, you know, that all changes due to us gaining more information and learning more about the sinking. So I can't really knock on that. It's just a historical inaccuracy that I noticed. So if you've never seen this movie before, you're going for a really historically accurate movie, you're going to have a couple of the facts that aren't right. Overall, I would still give this movie a really, really good score because I still love it. I still would definitely go back and watch it a hundred times more. And I still really connect to the story, especially now that I'm married and have a family. You know, I really connect to that feeling of dread and that feeling of sadness when, you know, when Jack dies ultimately. So. I would still give this movie easily an 8.5 or a 9 out of 10. And I know that might be a little controversial. So feel free to leave your comments below. Let me know how you feel about this movie. Um, if there's anything I got wrong in this video, please feel free to correct it or add to the conversation. I would love to open up a discussion for everyone. But just remember to keep it friendly with each other. There's no need to insult me. There's no need to insult each other. It's a ship that sank 110 years ago. We don't need to get super nitpicky about it, okay? But you guys are usually pretty awesome. That will do it for this review of James Cameron's Titanic. I'm sorry it's so long-winded. I had a lot of thoughts on this one. Let me know how you guys are feeling about this movie and about Titanic Month. Thank you guys so much for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. If you are listening on an audio-only format, please remember to subscribe and leave us a five-star review since it does help us reach more listeners like you. And we will see you on Sunday.
Thank you guys so much.